Research and Extension Center. Uh, he will be presenting about the application of plastic biodegradable mulches on tissue culture red raspberry. Okay, team, you are here. Good, I'm good. All right. My name is Huan Zhang, and I'm advised by Dr. Lisa DeVetter and Dr. Carol Miles. We are located in Mount Vernon, Washington State University Northwestern Research and Extension Center. And my research title is Application of Biodegradable Plastic Mulches in Tissue Culture Red Raspberry. But before introducing my research to you, I want to introduce my research team to you first. And me is on the, let me see, can I touch it? No, okay, never mind. So I'm on the top, uh, uh, top right corner and my advisor, top left, co-advisor, Carol Mills. And uh, my committee members, Chris Benedict, who is sitting there from WSU, what can, Welcome County Extension Office, and Dr. Inga Zasada from USDARS, and a PhD student from our station, Shrash Jamir. So before getting into our research, let's review our rationale first. And the first rationale of our research is a tissue culture plug establishment. As you all know that the growers are start starting increasingly using the tissue culture blocks in the red raspberry production. The reasons they are using, using that because it can generate a lot of plants in a small operation. And also it can generate clean materials free from disease, pests, and virus. However, the growers sometimes find that the tissue culture plugs are hard to establish compared with the root cuttings and root kings, and they are weak weed competitors sometimes. So this one actually brings us to our second nation, uh, rationale, which is the biodegradable plastic mulches. But before telling you about something about biodegradable plastic mulches, let's review the mulch used in the agriculture first. And the mulch are some physical coverings on the soil surface and made from nat naturally or synthetic materials. Usually it is petroleum based material. And the, uh, the reason to use mulch is uh, because they can uh, control the weeds, they can increase soil temperature and reduce the soil in vibration and overall increase the crop growth. However, the biodegradable plastic mulches are made from uh, different feedstocks and additives from PE, which is polyethylene mulch, uh, and it has, a, it has a capability of being broken down by the biological activities into carbon dioxide, water, and a bio, um, and a bio, bio, uh, bio, bio and a microbial biomass. Sorry, lots of studies have been done testing the. BDM, which is biodegradable plastic mulches in annual vegetable production systems, where results have been promising and showed their potential application in the, com in the commercial settings. However, few studies have been done testing the BDM in perennial systems like raspberry. Perennial system could benefit from BDM during the first few months or two years of plant establishment and an appealing aspect of BDM or of plastic mulch is that they can deteriorate over time, which would be desirable for a planting system has been established and the mulch is no longer needed. And up to, uh, plus the, B, the BDM could reduce the mulch removal associated with the mulch and it also has the potential to reduce the plastic waste generation, and overall it can increase the on-farm efficiency. Up to BC, uh, British Columbia, Dr. Jabran found that increased uh, uh, plant growth uh, under, uh, of TC plug, tissue culture red raspberry plug in under BDM, or under PE uh, treatment compared with uh, no much control, which is growers standard practice. And also a study in Poland found that increasing yield was found under BD, BDM treatment in uh, primary king fruiting raspberry compared with the no mulch treatment. 
And how, although there are so many benefits associated with the BDM, the BDM do have some potential uh, disadvantages. And this brings us to our third rationale, which is the root lesion nematodes. And in plant parasitic nematodes population, uh, plant parasitic nematodes are another major pest of red raspberry production, particularly root lesion nematodes, RLN. And the Dr. Gerbrand reported the increased nematode population was found under B treatment compared with the bare ground control, which in the, may indicate that the, the PE or the mulch could encourage the RLN activity. However, to our knowledge, there is no study have been done testing the, BD, uh, testing the RLN population under much in any production system. So we are the first one to explore the RL activity due to elevated soil moisture and the temperature under mulch treatment. So based on this, we have a thesis that the BDM will promote plant establishment compared to non mulch control and thereby enhancing yield and on farm profitability. So to test this idea, we are, conduct, we are conducting our research in, uh, into raspberry, commercial raspberry uh, fields uh, here, Watcom County, London. And we have two planting systems. The spring, plant, the spring planted system is established in May, uh, on May 18, 2017, and the full plant trail was established on August 9, 2017. And our objectives are to look at uh, how BDM and PE impact on plant growth, fruit yield with incidence, soil temperature and moisture, root lesion nematodes population, relative to growers' standard practice, which is no mulch control. And because this study includes the plastic mulch, BDM and PE, so the surface and in-soil mulch degradation will also be assessed. Here is our experimental design, and the spring trail is on the left, the full trail is on the right. The spring trail is 0 .2, 0 0.8 acres, whereas the full trail is 2 acres. They all are statistical valid design and the randomized the complete block with the five replicates, five replicates, six treatments. The plot length of the spring trail is 120 feet, and the full trail is 210 feet. We block the spring trail across the row and the foot trail along the row to control the variations due to soil texture. And the fumigation used in the spring trail was, was broadcast fumigated in September 2016. In the foot trail was better fumigated in June 2017. About the cultivars we are using in both trails are only available through tissue culture. And the one we used in the spring trail is a weak field and in the fall trail is a weak haven. Here is the treatment we applied to our field and there are six treatments. I call it A, B, C, D, E, F, and A to D are BDM treatments and E is polyethylene. F is grow our standard practice, which is no mulch control. And this is what we used to apply our treatments, uh, apply our mulch, and, but I think you guys are all great mechanics compared to our research nerds. You can make a better one. And this is a, a mechanical planter used by grower Randy Hanhop. Randy Hancock, he has been uh, ado adopted a BDM over three years, and this is what he used to plant his tissue culture plants. Now, I want to take you to our journey in our spring trail. While you are traveling in our field, I also want you to pay attention to the plant growth in different plots over time. And this picture was taken the day that we just planted our tissue culture plots. And this one was taken a month and a half later. Uh, and you can actually tell some difference from this picture, but not quite. I'll show a picture and compare those two treatments. And this is the picture taken two months later, and you can see there is a quite difference here. And this picture was taken three months later. And this one was taken like three and a half months later of our treatments. And this one was taken four months later. It's like a raspberry jungle, and we're exploring our raspberry jungle here. And 
This picture is taken four and a half months later, and this is five, five months later. It's crazy, the plant's growth. And now let's move to our data collection section. Uh, I have four categories of data collection to share with you, plant response, pests, soils, and mulch. The first one I want to share with you is the plant response. We measure the plant growth by measuring primary king heights and primary king numbers monthly, and we also measure our, uh, our plant leaf water potential and the photosynthetic rate during mid-July to mid-August. We, uh, at that time, we also measure the plant nutrition status, which is plant nu nutrient content. We will have our yield until next July, which is our spring trail with fruit. Um, let's see some pictures first. Uh, this shows you how do we measure the raspberry plants. Uh, the, the guy with the black t-shirt is me. I'm measuring the plant primary king height. The guy with the I don't know, he, the, he with the hunting gear or something, he is hunting the raspberry and he's actually counting the primary key numbers. And it's really interesting and fun to measure this because you notice the plant growth and you have some kind of affections to plants. And I see those plants like my babies. I just take care of them. And my grower also helps me take care of them. And this picture also shows how do we measure the plant. Primary key numbers, which is Sean. He, uh, on the left of the picture, he's marrying the, he's marrying the primary king numbers, and I am marrying the primary king height. And some interesting things when you do research is that when you marry, when you marry the primary king height, you might find the potato plants in the raspberry planting holes, or you might find the tree that's standing out of the raspberry field. And this is the data of our primary king height. And before interpreting the data to you, let's review what are the statistical signs here. The NS means no statistic difference, and the asterisk, uh, the signs means there is statistical difference, and different number of these symbols means different statistical numbers. And you can tell from the picture that there is only one day that which is uh, um, May 25th, there is no statistical difference. And then this is a day that we collect our plant baseline height, so there is no statistical difference. But after that, only a month later after, after our first uh, measurement, there, ha there was a statistical difference. And, uh, on the data collection, um, July 28th, uh, all the mulch treatment had a higher, uh, had a statistical higher primary king height compared with the uh, no mulch treatment, which is bare ground. And this trend kept uh, throughout our project. And on the last day, which is uh, October 27th, the average of the primary king height in the mulch treatments is like 16 inches higher than the bare ground control. That is um, quite the difference. And this picture uh, or this data is the primary key numbers data. There is no statistical di difference from the, on July 28th because the first day, which is July 28th, when we measure the primary key numbers, we only measure the primary key that coming from the uh, soil, coming from the crown. But actually, the weak field cultivar tend to produce the primary key up above the crown. So we, after the July 28th, we measure any primary king that is over 12 inches. And uh, on October 30th, you can find that all the mulch treatment had a higher statistical, higher primary king numbers than bare ground control. And the reason that you see a trend that decline after October 30th is may due to the senescence of the plants or some came die back because of uh, some powder mildew or spider mats we found in the, our trail. But uh, on the last day of the data collection, October 27th, we still found a statistical higher primary key numbers in mulch treatment and which is five primary key uh, more than the bare ground control. This picture is the plant growth we took on July 6th, which is a month and a half later after our, our treatments. And the difference of the mulch treatments and the bare ground control is 
three inches, and that that is a hundred fifty percent increase. And the second category of my data collection is weight number. We measure the weights in a like eleven feet square feet area in each plot, and we measure it monthly, same time as we measuring the plant growth, and. We also measure the uh, RLN root and soil densities, and I'll share this data with you here. Yeah. Um, in our spring trial, the growers uh, applied once post the herbicide and also hand weighted our bare ground control three times with each weight uh, costing like 45 minutes. Although they did these activities to our field, we also found there is a statistical difference between the treatments, and all the mulch the treatments had a statistical lower weight number compared with the bare ground control, except the August 30s. There is no statistical difference. This picture showed you um, the difference between the treatments, and this photo was taken from our full trial in September. And you can tell in our in the bare ground control there are lots of weeds, but in the mulch treatments there are fewer or no weeds. And root for the root lesion nematodes, this data is uh, from the day we collect um, October 10th. And there is no statistical difference between the treatments, although you can find some numeric numerical difference between treatments, but those those uh, data are, or those numbers did not be on the threshold. And the third category of our data collection is the soil temperature, soil moisture, and the soil nutrition status. There was no soil nutrition status between treatments, but for the soil temperature, overall our project through June and, uh, June and August, we we found that the, all the, uh, the average soil temperature in the mulch the treatments was 2.5 Fahrenheit higher than bare ground control. Some careful audience may find that there's a, a change for this orange color uh, line that, we, that is organics point six, which is the BDM treatments. We move the sensor because the original hole the soil is uh, not like uh, similar to other soil in the field. So we move to a, a repre representative uh, plants. And uh, the average of um, soil water content was the greatest in the PE treatment and followed by Bell 360, uh, Bell 360.6. I'm sorry for there is no sound of other three, three treatments here. I think it's just uh, from Mac to um, Microsoft, uh, the PowerPoint just uh, changed it a little bit. And uh, for the greatest soil moisture was found in PE treatment and followed by Bell 360.6 and bare ground control. The reason that we, uh, we think the bare ground control had a higher soil uh, moisture than some of our BDM treatments is that inconsistent distance between the, our decagon soil sensor and the drip line emitters. And we also, uh, you, you may see there is a decline in the organics point six because we moved it in on July 14. And last category of the data collection is the personal soil exposure, in short PSE. Uh, for PSE, we are marrying in a 11 square feet region in each plot. The reason of marrying the PSE is to see how the mulch deteriorates over time and the rate of the deterioration. And there is no degradation until July 14th and after August 15th, degradation, degradation rate in the BDM treatments increased, whereas the PE mulch still kept intact with the soil. And you can tell from the data that on August 15th, all the BDM treatment had a statistical higher PIC, which is personal soil exposure than bare ground control. And what we can learn from this data is that you can choose the products with your preferred degradation rate to your production systems. And during the research, there are lots of questions raised by the growers and other researchers. And I picked the three of them to answer here. The first one is the can I apply the BDM 
as part of my soil fumigation operation. The answer from the WSDA and the EPA is BDM are not legally allowed to be applied as part of the soil fumigation operation and, and therefore cannot contribute to reducing the emissions and buffer zones. And the second question is what, the, what are the materials can I apply during the soil fumigation from the EPA? Tarps must be highly impermeable and be tested for permeability and quality for buffer zone reduction. And the third question is, are there any regulations or limitations for adding BDMs into my soil? As for the um, conventional systems, there is no regulations for adding BDMs or incorporating BDMs into your soil. But for the organic production systems, the only the BDM, uh, the only the bio-based BDM are on the allowed list. However, in the commercial, there is no available plastic mulch or, or plastic BDM are met the, the national organic program specifications. And those are some take notes I want to share with you. The known things during our research, we have we, we already know that the BDM could provide the great weed management. BDM can improve primary king growth, and it has a function of modification of soil moisture and the temperature. And amazingly, the BDM can survive in the wind. And the picture on the right uh, bottom corner was taken on like mid November, which is after like several huge winds in Watercombe County. And we thought the BDM may die during the wind, but when we took the page, we went, when we went to the field and see the mulch, it is still keep in, um, intact with the soil. And we are happy with that. And the things we are still exploring, like the RLN I mentioned before, RLN density, and we will collect the data next spring and the next uh, fall, and uh, we will share our data on some additional resources I will list later. And the yield of our treatments, we will until, we will, we don't know our yield until next July because we will harvest our spring trail in 2018 July. And if you are, you know, wondering, uh, you, if you are wondering whether you should adopt the BDM or not, you can wait until next July, our yield data. And those are some additional resources. You can check out our research and some also other related information, the Small Fruit Horticulture website. And we have some fact sheets about the BDM cost and the mechanical laying mulch on our website. And about the BDM, there is a website about degradable mulch. You can also check out that. And some other additional resources are live, like my advisor, Dr. Lisa DeVetter, and my co-advisor, Carol Miles, and me, you can just email us, or you can tweet our my advisor. She's active on Twitter. And in closing, I, wanted, I want to say thanks to the people that helped me and the growers that supported us, our research, and also the funding resources, Red Raspberry Commission and the uh, uh, Pesticide Commission, uh, Washington Commission on Pesticide Registration and some material that provided by the manufacturers. And thank you very much. Any questions? We have four minutes for questions. Juan, that was a nice presentation. Thank you. Good job. Nice data set, too. I'm curious as to what you think the BDM, um, how it will slow down primocane growth next spring. Do you think it's going to be a problem to maintain that BDM into the second growing season? Do you mean, um, do you mean like the emergencies or the just the growth? Emergence. Uh, Primarily, but I wonder growth too. You think the BDM is going to be? Will it allow primocane growth between the different plugs starting next spring? 
that's a great question. And for the emergencies, so actually that's one of our activities for next year. We will measure the emergency in the spring trial in April and May. And for the growth, we, we hope that the plant growth is still you know, higher in our BDM and PE treatment compared with bare ground control. Thank you, it's not a hard question. Thank you very much. <laughs> Does your team have any experience using uh, BDM with squash production, like pumpkins? Uh, Does, have you guys used it in squash production? Oh, so the question is either uh, have we used the pumpkin or have we used the BDM for squash pumpkin production? And my co-advisor, Carol Miles, at least uh, on the slides here, she has w been working on BDM on the vegetable production for for many years, and she worked a lot on pumpkin, squash, even watermelon, corn, sweet corn, yeah. And it has been a really great result on the pumpkin as well, and the corn. Good, you guys so nice, no question. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Juan. For the next session, we would like to welcome Dr. Lisa Dovetters. She is assistant professor.